Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you. Good to see you here. Our text this morning is in the book of Joshua. We're coming sort of toward the end of our study in the next few weeks, but we're going to look at two chapters, verses 16 and 17. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on chapter 16, uh, mainly in chapter 17, the gist of chapter 16 is the boundaries of the tribe of Ephraim. It it begins with a kind of general uh, description of the sons of Joseph, and then it gives specifics as to the boundary of the tribe of Ephraim, and then chapter 17 is the boundary of the tribe of Manasseh. I'm going to comment on those boundaries and the significance of them, but we're going to concentrate on the conversations that take place in two different occasions in chapter 17. Uh, for example, in chapter, th- and this is where I'll, uh, I'll begin with verse 10 of chapter 16, but then skip down to verse 3 of 17 and read uh, two of those verses where they have a conversation between Joshua and Eleazar the high priest and the five daughters of Zelophehad. And this is a passage that really goes back to number 17 with a conversation to Moses. These daughters were the only children that Zelophehad had. He didn't have a son. And so who's to inherit his inheritance? Who's to, who is his, his inheritance to go to? And Moses deals with that and promises it to these five daughters with some restrictions. And so they now come to Joshua and ask for that inheritance which Moses promised them. And then we'll look at mainly the conversation that Joseph, the, the, the tribe of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim have with Joshua, um, beginning with, uh, well, we'll begin with verse 12 of verse 17. First of all, the, the, in, verse, in chapter 16, the inheritance, the tribal territory is given. And then in verse 10, we read this statement, which is something of a theme we follow in these later chapters. Speaking of the tribe of Ephraim, but they did not drive out the Canaanites. Well, now we come to verse 3 of chapter 17. However, Zelophead the son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons, only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Mahla and Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah. They came near before Eleazar the priest and before Joshua the son of Nun, And before the leaders, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. So according to the command of the Lord, he, Joshua, gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers. And now the inheritance of Manasseh is given in the cities that they have, that are given to them also. In verse 11, you have these cities, but then we read in verse 12, and I'll read on through the end of the chapter. But the sons of Manasseh could not take possession of these cities because the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. It came about when the sons of Israel became strong. They put the Canaanites to forced labor, labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Then the sons of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, Why have you given me only one lot and one portion for an inheritance since I am a numerous people whom the Lord has thus far blessed? Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up to the forest and clear a place for yourselves, for yourself in that land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. Sons of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who live in the valley land have chariots of iron, both those who are in Beit Shan and its towns and those who are in the valley of Jezreel. 
Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one lot only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it, and to its farthest borders it shall be yours. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, even though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and our bless, bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. As you read through the New Testament, you notice the frequent references to sports and war. They are common metaphors for the Christian life. Paul spoke of boxing and wrestling and running, as well as fighting with swords and armor, all to illustrate the nature of the Christian life. It's a battle, and it can be exhausting, it can be discouraging. One of the great stories of uh, college sports is about Bear Bryant's 1954 Texas Aggie football team and their 10 days of practice in Junction, Texas. I first learned of that when I was in high school and reading Sports Illustrated. That was probably 11 years after the event, but it was a legend back then. The day they arrived, the team went swimming and they had a ball. The next day, the fun ended. It was practice in 100 degree heat twice a day in a pasture full of rocks and cactuses or cacti without water breaks. Gene Stalling said, they went, to junction, we went, they went to junction in two buses and came back home in one. But the 35 players out of the 111 that returned became a champion team. Bear Bryant was tough, but I guess a coach who got his nickname for wrestling a bear in a carnival when he was 13 would have a hard time sympathizing with college kids who were tired and sore. That's hard to argue with success, but the best leadership combines encouragement with discipline. The author of Hebrews inspired and counseled both. Like Paul, he, he drew from sports as well. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, he compared the Christian life to a race, a marathon. It's, a, it, it's long and grueling. But then in verse 12, he said, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And that command is in the plural. It, it's to the church. And, and, and his command is to help the weak among them, to strengthen and encourage so that they all finish the course. We're in it together. Joshua did that. He, he was a leader who fortified the feeble. And after seven years of war, up and down Canaan, the men of Israel were weary of fighting, and, and maybe they suffered from some combat fatigue. The problem was they had not finished their mission. And their failure is, is noted in the statement, but they did not drive out the Canaanites. And that's in chapter 16 and 17. They owned the land, they, they'd conquered Canaan, but they needed to eliminate the pockets of resistance that remained. They wanted to lay down their swords. Joshua wouldn't allow that. But first, they had another task, and that was dividing the land among the tribes for their inheritance. And that's the subject of this portion of the book of Joshua from chapters 13 through 19. Chapters 16 and 17 are about the division for the two tribes of Joseph, the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. They received a large portion of the territory in the, the center of the land west of the Jordan River. 
The amount of land they received indicated the, the privileged position they had among the tribes. Joseph saved the nation when he was prime minister of Egypt. Then Jacob, his father, blessed Joseph's two sons in Genesis 48. Both sons developed separately to become two tribes. But their original unity is recalled here in verse 1 where only one lot was drawn for them. It's called the lot of the sons of Joseph. They complained about this. It's recorded in chapter 17, verse 14. The sons of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, why have you given me only one lot and one portion? Uh, both had large tribes. So the two tribal territories were given to them. And while they functioned as, as two distinct tribes of great importance, they were considered the half-tribes of the tribe of Joseph. Half of the half-tribe of Manasseh settled east of the Jordan River. I've mentioned this a number of times, but they settled in what is called Transjordan. The other half settled west of the Jordan in Canaan, their inheritance is described in chapter 17. The tribal territory of Ephraim is given first in chapter 16 and verses 5 through 9. It is the southern word, southern uh, of the two tribes. Its boundaries extended just short of the Jordan River on the east and to the Mediterranean Sea on the west. Uh, with the tribes of Benjamin and Dan as its border on the south, and then the brook of Cana on the north. And I've, I think it's, it's rather obvious to state this. I've stated it before, but in a study like this, it's probably more helpful to simply look at the map in the back of your Bible to see where this is and the dimensions of it, rather than try to imagine it, uh, its location size from the details that are described here in this text. But... Those details are, are certainly important, important to them. Each tribe needed to, to have a specific record of its borders. Uh, but what it teaches us also is that God fulfills His Word. He fulfilled His promise to the nation. He promised them an inheritance, and here they're having it. They're obtaining this inheritance. And He gave it to each tribe. Manasseh's inheritance is given in chapter 17 and verses 7 through 11. The, the Jordan River was its eastern border. The Mediterranean was its western border. Ephraim on the south. And then the Jezreel Valley was its border on the north. Uh, together, these tribes occupied what is called the hill country in verse 16 of chapter 17. Uh, the term hill country is often associated with the tribe of Judah, but the, the hill country extended from, from Judah all the way up to the Jezreel Valley. So these two tribes controlled the central part of Canaan. It was a, a large area of land, and, and it was rich land, particularly the Jezreel Valley is today as well. Uh, today, this area is largely the, the West Bank with lots of uh, Arab villages and mosques. But uh, looking at a map, you, you, you gives you a sense of how large the area was that was allotted to these two tribes, especially when considering that tribe of, of Manasseh on the east side of the Jordan, in Transjordan. God had given these tribes a large inheritance by His decree and grace. They only needed to finish taking it by driving out the remaining Canaanites. And God would bless their efforts. But in the middle of all of this, in chapter 17, we read of two daughters, or rather, we read of some daughters of Zelophehad, not two, but five in verses three and four. They're mentioned here to, to give a conclusion to the story from Numbers 27, as I mentioned in the reading of the text, 
27 verses 1 through 11. And I think they're mentioned here for another reason in light of the things we've just said. But here they're mentioned, and they're mentioned here because normally, as I said, the inheritance would pass from a person to his descendants through the firstborn son. But Zelophead had no sons. He had only daughters. He had five of them. So they went to Moses years back with this problem of who would be the heir of their father's inheritance since he had no, since he had no son. So Moses considered their problem and he declared that they, the daughters, and others like them in a similar situation would receive the inheritance. He put certain requirements on them in terms of marriage. They must marry within their tribe, but they would receive the inheritance. Well, that was some seven years earlier, and now they've come to Joshua and to Eleazar the priest to remind them of the promise that Moses gave and how he had ruled in their favor, and now they're seeking to have what is theirs. And we read in verse 4, they came near both, they came near before Eleazar the priest, and before Joshua the son of Nun, and before the leader, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Now they remind these two men of that, and so the result is, according to the command of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers. Well, why is this included? Well, I think it's included here for a number of reasons. You have these sort of these interesting conversations that take place throughout the, the, uh, the division of the land. And first of all, it's to show that God's word was fulfilled. He, he gives the, the rest of the story from Numbers 27 here to show that God's faithful to His Word. And, and these, these uh, daughters received the inheritance that was promised. But in addition to that, it, it shows the value these five daughters placed on their inheritance. They were eager to get it. And you see that in contrast to these tribes who failed to secure their inheritance. Again, God had richly blessed the tribes, all of them, but especially the, the, the tribes we're considering here, the tribes of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Yet both of those tribes failed to claim all that he had given to them. In verse uh, 10 of chapter 16, But they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites live in the midst of Ephraim to this day and they became forced laborers. The city of Gezer didn't become uh, Israel's possession. They didn't come, uh, it didn't come under their control until Solomon. And the reason Solomon obtained it is because Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt came up and conquered that town and killed all the Canaanites. You find this in 1 Kings 9, verse 16. And then he gave that city to Solomon as a dowry when he married the daughter of Pharaoh, which never should have happened. But why so long had that city remained outside of the control of the sons of Israel and the, the uh, Ephraimites? Well, it shows the failure. And we see the same thing with uh, Manasseh. Its failure is described in the same way. In verse 11 of chapter 17, there's a list of cities that Manasseh had inherited. And then in verse 12 and 13, we read, But the sons of Manasseh could not take possession of these cities because the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. It came about when the sons of Israel became strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Well, this is very similar to what we read earlier in chapter 15 of the, the tribe of Judah. We considered that last week. And they failed to capture Jerusalem. And that's how chapter 15 ends. Verse 63, as 
For the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the sons of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites live with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem until this day. Three tribes in three chapters, the strongest tribes, failed in their mission. And the implication, as I suggested last week, is failure was due to sloth rather than Canaanite strength. The, the women of this book are set in stark contrast to the men. These five daughters from Manasseh and earlier Aksa, Caleb's daughter, who boldly got her inheritance. On the one hand, it shows, considering these women, it shows the elevated respect for women in Israelite society compared to most societies that regarded women as more property than anything else. But more than that, I think more to the context, what this shows is they valued the inheritance while the men, the warriors, were growing weary. But while they were growing weary, these women weren't. If, if they could have put on armor and fought the Canaanites for what was rightly theirs, they would have done that. They gave an example of, of what is to be done. The men of Judah needed that, and they lacked persistence, they lacked perseverance, so did the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. They, they settled for a kind of peaceful coexistence with the enemy. And it was disobedience. Earlier, Moses had given them instruction in Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 through 18, where he stated clearly what they were to do. They were to destroy the Canaanites. You shall not leave alive anything that breathes. I know that, that seems harsh. We've considered that in the past. But this command, you need to remember, was unique to the Canaanites. It was judgment on their unbelief. It was judgment on their cruel pagan culture. And it was protective as well. Because were they to be tolerated, were they to be allowed to live among the Israelites, they would infect them with their paganism. That's why they could not tolerate them. And that's, you know, the history is what happened. Now what this is a, a, an outworking of is the patience of God. The patience of God had endured this pagan Canaanite culture for 500 years or more, and now that patience of God was at an end. They were to be judged. Israel was to do that, but Israel failed. And they disobeyed God for two reasons. First, weariness, as I've suggested, battle fatigue. And secondly, materialism. Verse 13 of, of chapter 17 states, they put the Canaanites to forced labor. They, they chose not to destroy them, but instead used them as cheap labor for their own financial gain. And they, they did this, according to verse 13, when Israel was strong, when Israel had the power and the advantage. Now they rolled over them to begin with when they conquered the land. They rolled over all of the Canaanite armies when the Canaanite armies were strong which shows that God gave them, was, was with them and faithful to them, and He was far more powerful than their enemies. But the Canaanites in the providence of God persisted. They fought hard. They wouldn't give up. So the Israelites did. Seven years of war had, had worn on them. They were tired of the fight. And they made peace with the enemy. Francis Schaeffer wrote a brief commentary on the book of Joshua some 50 plus years ago. He called these tribes practical materialists who for the sake of ease and money 
didn't obey the Lord. And he made the application to the church, which is how we should take this. This is how we should understand it. It's history, but we learn from history, and this has application to us. And so he made that application. He wrote, we Christians stand in the same danger. It is all too easy to fail to possess the possessions God has promised because we either lack, we, we either draw back in fear, or we become caught up in the affluent society. Well, there are consequences to what we do, there are consequences to what they did. So Israel needed to continue the fight, but they didn't want to do that. And we learn something about their problem in verses 14 through 18 of the 17th chapter. They approached Joshua with a complaint. They were large tribes, and they considered their, their portion of Canaan, they considered their inheritance to be small, and they thought they needed more room. And so Joshua took them at their word and gave them some advice. He told them to clear out the land if they wanted more space. Verse 15, Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up to the forest and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the Perizzite and the Rephaim. Now the Rephaim were fearsome giants. And so he's saying, go fight those giants and clear the land, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. In other words, they had room, they had plenty of space. God didn't leave them less than they needed. They had all that they needed. They just needed to get to work, clearing it and cultivating it and conquering it. Go after those giants. Now, this gives us an, an interesting fact about Israel. At, uh, at this time, the time of Joshua, it was heavily wooded. In the book of Daniel, Israel is referred to as the beautiful land. It had forests as well as pastures. But you wouldn't know that if you had looked, uh, if you if you just seen pictures of of the Holy Land of Israel from a uh, hundred years ago, or even less than that. It was barren. It was lots of rocky hills. That's the image a lot of people have of what it was like. Well, that is due to a long history of of uh, wars being fought there. Uh, the uh, the Indians, the American Indians, referred to a section in northern. New York State as the war path because they had fought lots of battles there and then the British and the Americans fought battles there in that part of New York. Well, this was the war path of the ancient world. The Egyptians would come up through that Canaan and Israel and uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians would come down and this is the path through which they would travel to fight one another. And, and so that's one of the reasons for that condition, but also just the, the fact that there was overgrazing of the land for centuries. It was not taken care of. It became defoliated and eroded. And that's now changing. The modern state of Israel is uh, reforesting the land. And for many decades, they've been doing that. I think they, the, I, I read a figure where they have planted something like uh, over 260 million trees, and I suppose now it's closer to 300 million trees, reclaiming the rocky countryside, even down into the semi-arid Negev. They've transformed that country. But that's the way it was in Joshua's day, a, a land of forests. And he didn't dispute the, the idea that they were cramped for space. But his answer wasn't the answer that they wanted to hear. He said, in effect, if you want more land because you're so numerous, then go to work. Use your great numbers to cut down trees and clear space. And in doing that, he turned their complaint against them and, and indirectly, and maybe not so subtly, rebuked their inaction. 
You've recognized the problem, now go fix it. Well, that's a, a lesson for us. And I think very much uh, it explains the way this church functions. Oftentimes people will recognize a problem and they'll bring the problem to the attention of the elders or maybe some of the teachers. And, and it may be a genuine problem, but the answer that we often give is then take care of it. Or people will just do that. And I've seen a lot of that. They'll recognize that there needs to be a teacher here and they're glad to do that. Or they see how there needs to be a help given in a certain area and they're willing to help. It was pointed out to me not that long ago um, that there is a lot of ministry that goes on in this church uh, under the radar, so to speak. And it isn't seen by most people that you're not maybe all that aware of, but there are people doing all kinds of things to help one another. Maybe it's calling people up, particularly in this time of uh, the pandemic. To go back to Mark's lesson, one, one way people help and one way we can all help is to be men and women of prayer and constantly involved in that. Um, there's a lot of, of work that goes on unseen. And um, that's what we need to see. And the, that, that should be an encouragement to you. Encouragement isn't coddling and it isn't uh, indulging. It is recognizing a problem and then giving the right advice. And that's what, what, uh, what Joshua was doing here. He recognized the problem here was not that they didn't have enough land. The problem was they didn't have the will and the resolve to go claim the land that they had. And so Joshua challenged them. And uh, the men of Joseph responded, but they didn't respond the way they should have responded. They, they, they uh, were still not moved to action in, in uh, verse 16. They basically repeat the complaint that they had made, uh, saying that the hill country was not enough for them. But then they added that they, they couldn't move into the valley because the Canaanites had a cavalry and it was formidable, it was mechanized. All the Canaanites who live in the valley land have chariots of iron. Now they didn't want to go up into the hills to conquer and clear it. That's, that's where the giants were. And they didn't want to go down into the valley to fight horses and chariots. What they were really saying is they didn't want to fight anymore. And look, Seven years of war is a long time to fight. And remember, these are people who were born in the desert. They lived traveling from place to place like nomads. They lived in tents. Now they've come to the promised land and they fought for seven years at least. They have cities and they have houses, but they can't obtain them until they finish the battle, and they're ready to stop fighting. They're ready to go to their houses and farm their lands. I can only imagine how, how it can wear down a person and a person's resolve when the fight keeps going on and on. Nevertheless, that was the mission before them, and they had not yet completed the mission. They had not yet completed the mission, but God was still there. God was not absent. So Joshua responded to their objection, but didn't do so as he might have responded. He might have tried to shame them into action. That's the way some people seek to lead others. He might have said, sit down here for a moment. Let me tell you about uh, five sisters that came to me. I talked to them and they were eager eager to have their inheritance. And they'd be out there fighting for it if they could. Why aren't you? Or he might have said, have you heard about Caleb and the giants that he drove out of Hebron? He didn't do that. Instead, he encouraged them. He reminded them of their strength. He reminded them that their strength is God-given. God is with them. 
And he stated their confidence in them to fight. The chapter ends, verses 17 and 18. Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one lot only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it. And to its farthest border it shall be yours. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, even though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. And if he had had access to Psalm 20, he could have quoted verse 7, Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord. Now, Joshua didn't need that. That's basically what he's saying to them. He didn't have that psalm, but he didn't need it because he had recent history that basically said the same thing and which probably was, was what inspired David when he wrote his psalm because Joshua's army had recently defeated the northern Canaanites, which was a vast army, and they had chariots, which the Israelites didn't. Nevertheless, they defeated them. So Joshua could tell them with firm confidence, you shall drive out the Canaanites even though they have chariots of iron. They'd done it before. And they'd done it before because the Lord was with them. But part of the problem, I think really the root of the problem, was they'd forgotten the Lord. They'd forgotten His promises to them and instead they were thinking about what seemed to them to be just an endless war. It's the problem a runner has, I suppose, in, in a race, and he gets tired, a marathon, it's a long race, and he gets to the point where this is a grind, and takes his eyes off perhaps the finish line, and, and the temptation is to stop. And knowing that, the author of Hebrews chose that as the metaphor for the Christian life, which is also long. It doesn't end this side of heaven. We're always in the battle. We're always in the fight. So spiritually, our arms get weak and our legs get feeble. The only way to run it or live it is the way the author of Hebrews says at the beginning of that passage in chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. We must always have Christ before us in our thoughts. If we are to run the race well, if we're to fight the battle with perseverance. Now what does that mean to have Christ before us? It means understanding who He is and what He's done. That's the strongest motivation in the Christian life. Paul spoke of it in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. He wrote, the love of Christ controls us, or the love of Christ constrains us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Christ's death, His sacrifice, saves. And Paul could think of that and think, I am saved and I am what I am by His grace and His great sacrifice for me. And knowing that, the apostle said, controlled or constrained his behavior. It constrained his thinking, his thoughts, and his actions. Christ's love for him, that he would die and save such a person as unworthy as the apostle Paul himself. So he lived his life for Christ. Not, not out of a sense of duty, though there is duty to the Christian life. And Paul knew that he had a sense of duty to serve the Lord, to be obedient. But that's not what drove him. What drove him was gratitude, thankfulness. And the more we understand Christ and His love for us, what He left for us, and what He did to save us, the more we understand that, the more we will gladly sacrifice for Him. And do so confidently. Do so by faith, knowing that the One who saved us 
is Lord over all. He is Lord over time and space. We are absolutely secure in Him. He will never desert us. He will never fail us. And we will triumph as we serve Him. You, you see that in Paul's life. You see that in the lives of the other apostles. But you see that, that attitude and that, that ambition for, for the Lord in other people's lives too. Out of church history, I think of, think of various people, but one that came to mind was C.T. Studd, who was a missionary to China and then a missionary to the Congo. He was a remarkable man. He was born into wealth and privilege in England, and he enjoyed national fame as a, as a cricket player at Cambridge. But he left all of that in order to preach the gospel in foreign lands where he spent his life in very hard circumstances. Well, he wrote some memorable lines. One of them is one you're probably familiar with. Only one life will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will last. And another one was, some want to live within the sound of church bell or chapel bells. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Now, that was Joshua and Caleb, men who, who fought the Lord's war to the end. It was not so much the man of Joseph. They weren't getting within a yard of hell. They were weary of war. They were weak. Joshua tried to strengthen them, but uh, some people just will not be encouraged. They will not receive wise counsel when it's given. And many in Israel at that time were like that. They were weary. And so they made peace with the enemy. Whatever the immediate benefits of doing that, it was short-lived. And you know that if you read on in the Bible through the book of Judges. Because the, the, there we, we read that um, the, uh, the enemy that they tolerated and turned into their servants, a next generation got the upper hand and made slaves of them. So there are lessons in all of this for us. And first is a warning against the danger of relaxing in the fight of faith. Slowing down in the race and then stopping. Compromising with the world. The church is always under pressure to do that to conform to the world and do the things the way the world does them in order to make some. Uh, some um, more effective appeal to people, Christians and non-Christians alike. There's nothing wrong with being appealing. Nothing wrong with having a message be clear, presented well. There's nothing wrong with growing as a church. We want to grow. All of that's good in and of itself, unless it is done at the cost of the truth or the cost of obedience to the Lord. The strength of the church is the Word of God. The strength of the church is the Scriptures. And that, that is the center of the ministry. Preaching and teaching the whole counsel of God from beginning to end. And that's always threatened. It's been threatened from the very beginning of the church's history. The church has always been tempted to trim its sails to the wind. Go to the easiest direction. Modify its message a little. Uh, especially, I think that's true now. In an age when uh, a radical and hostile morality is roiling society. It's easier to adapt than to stand fast in the Scriptures. Well, it was that way in Paul's day. Paul urged Timothy, some of the last things that he wrote, the last counsel that he gave and. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebu rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. 
Preach the Word with instruction. Make the right applications, but preach the Word. That's what the church must do. And so, as a church, we can't compromise in that sense. But individually, each of us face challenges daily. We're tempted to, in some way or another, in a very subtle way, conform to the world. It, it's the problem of worldliness. It's the problem of materialism. Being, being guided more by our appetites and our interests than we are by Scripture and by thoughts of eternity and seeking to live for eternity. Instead of that, we become time servers. Living for the moment and, and not investing our lives in what lasts. The pressure to do that is great. I think it's subtle. But it's, and it's great, so that it's a struggle that we're in. And, and it's a lifelong struggle. It never ends. And we all feel it. Now, some of us, I think, as difficult as life can be, can't, we think of, the, I think of the, the, the people to whom, the Hebrews to whom the author of Hebrews wrote. They had gone through a long period, a protracted struggle. Some of them had been imprisoned. Others had lost property. They had lost everything in their faithfulness to the Lord, and they were beginning to flag in their faith. And so the author of Hebrews writes this great book of exhortation to encourage them on. But we all face difficulties of one kind or another. We are all in this race that can wear upon us, and we get tired, even defeated and discouraged like those sons of Joseph. And we're ready to make peace with the enemy and end the fight. We need to be encouraging one another not to conform. We need, as the author of Hebrews instructed those Jewish believers to whom he wrote, to strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. George Mueller gave us some, some of the kind of encouragement that we need when he said, to learn strong faith is to endure great trials. Now that may not be what we want to hear, but that is the kind of encouragement that we need. Because what he's saying is, if you want strong faith, endure, persevere, and your faith will be strengthened. And then he added, I have learned my faith by standing firm amid strong testing. So he gives us instruction, and then he says, I've done it. I've experienced it, and you will too. Uh, we don't need, in order to help one another grow, we don't need to be scolding one another. We need to be encouraging each other. It's part of Christian fellowship. It's, it's coming alongside and, and helping each other in a long race of faith. Now, you can't help... I can't help but admire the, and, be an, and be impressed with those 35 ball players that came home from Junction. They were tough. But wouldn't it have been much better if 111 had returned fit and ready for the season? That's our goal. For all of us to cross the finish line, we will do that by God's grace. He will not lose one of us. It's up to Him ultimately, not us. The believer will persevere to the end. John chapter 10, verse 28. Philippians 1, verse 6. And many others make that very clear. But we want to persevere triumphantly and enter into heaven and hear those words of Christ. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Master. And so Joshua's message to us is fight the good fight of faith and strengthen the feeble. That's the message for the believer in Jesus Christ. But if you're here without Him, if you've not believed in Him, then the message is very simple. Believe. Trust in Christ. Know that you are lost and you will soon enter eternity lost forever. The Son of God came into the world to seek and save the lost. So be found by Him. Believe in Him and be saved. Forgiven and given eternal life. 
And then take up the sword of the Spirit and fight the good fight for Him and for one another. May God help us to do that. Let's bow out a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for the example that we have in these tribes, um, an example of the negative, but it's a, a warning to us that uh, we are in a, a long race. We're in a protracted conflict. It, it goes on throughout this life. It won't end in this life, and we can get discouraged. But as Joshua told them at the very end, they will conquer as they act in faith, as they go forward. God had given them victory. He'd give them victory more as they went forward. And we need to do that too, Father. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. We need to, to think on Him and have Him before our minds and reflect on who He is and what He's done for us. Help us to do that. Help us to do that now as we turn our attention to the Lord's Supper and we might reflect deeply upon His person and work for us and, and what that means for us, how we should respond. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The importance of observing the Lord's Supper is apparent on a number of levels. Perhaps the most obvious is that it was the Lord's commandment that we do what we are now doing with the table before us, with the bread and the wine. We not, ought never to forget that it was the Lord who said, do this in remembrance of me. It was also the obvious practice of the early church. We've spoken of that more than once these past few weeks, but the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, that as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It must be very important uh, that we do that, that we proclaim his death. You're familiar, I know, with the account of the Lord's transfiguration uh, in the Bible. It's found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Jesus had taken uh, three of his disciples, uh, Peter and John and James, up on a mountain to pray when he was suddenly transfigured before them. His appearance was changed, his face shone like the sun, his garments became gleaming white as he apparently took upon himself a manifestation of the glory that was his before he became incarnate and took on human flesh. Dan uh, mentioned at the end of his sermon, here he is Lord over all. But the reason I mention it now is a piece of the incident that Luke recorded. Uh, two men were talking with him, Luke writes, and they were Moses and Elijah. Uh, these two giants of faith had been gone from the earth now uh, for centuries by this time, and Luke wrote that they were appearing in glory as they spoke with the Lord. Uh, we know that that was quite the sight for these three disciples who were at, at pains over how to respond to it. But it was the subject of the conversation between the Lord and Moses and Elijah that I want to highlight briefly this morning. Luke says that they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The topic of their conversation, in other words, was the very thing that we now celebrate and remember together again. There's much mystery about this scene of transfiguration. We cannot explain it all, but we do know what captivated the two great servants of God who had come down from heaven for this occasion. It was the purpose for which the Son of God came to earth and, and became a man. Having come down from heaven, they were in on Christ's mission, we might say. As Dan remarked some time ago, the atoning work of Christ is the central focus of heaven. So, of course, it was the topic Moses 
and Elijah were eager to explore. And now it is to be our focus uh, with grateful hearts. Uh, we who belong to the Lord Jesus and have trusted in him have the opportunity to remember uh, what he did for us, how our great God uh, became a man. He uh, uh, put away for a time the prerogatives of deity, and he allowed uh, himself to fulfill the great covenant of redemption. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so we remember that the night he was betrayed, he was with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to them, he said, take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup also after supper, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. So now it's uh, the occasion for us, uh, again, with grateful hearts, to remember that, uh, to now partake of the bread. Let me give thanks for it. Lord, we do thank you for this reminder uh, that the Lord Jesus took upon himself a human nature. Uh, he became uh, in, resembl in resemblance like a man because he took on human flesh. And this bread reminds us of that, that he didn't uh, hold on uh, to that deity, but he emptied himself for our benefit. So with grateful hearts, we remember the Lord Jesus in his name. I'm going to read 1 Peter 2, verse 24, and then make just a few comments. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. In Israel on the day of atonement the high priest would offer a goat on the altar and then do that for the sins of the nation and then he would sprinkle the blood in the Holy of Holies on the Mercy seat of the covenant. Find this in Leviticus chapter 17. And then he would place his hands on a second goat, the scapegoat. He would confess the sins of the nation as if to impute those sins to that goat. And then it would be driven out into a wilderness never to be seen again. Sins carried away. It's a picture of what Christ has done for us. He took our place in judgment. He took our sins upon Himself and removed them from us. The, the fatal wounds that sin inflicted on us have been healed by His wounds on the cross. We are now, as believers in Jesus Christ, as joined to Him and the recipients of all of that, we are healthy and whole, and we are able to live a life of holiness to Him. We're not perfect we are in the process of being sanctified, but we are able now to know Him and to serve Him and to serve Him with a life of holiness. That's what we're called to do. And that's what this cup reminds us of, of what He did for us and what we can now do in His service for Him and should do, as I suggested in our sermon, from gratitude and thanksgiving for his sacrifice for us. Let's give thanks for the cup that reminds us of that sacrifice. Father, we do thank you for the cup that's before us, that speaks of the blood of Christ that was shed for us. He came into this world to die. And to die a violent death, the death of a, a sacrifice, a vicarious sacrifice, uh, a sacrifice in our place, so that we would escape that eternal death that he suffered. So Lord, help us to reflect on that in these moments, on uh, what he left and what he experienced on our behalf and what we have as a result. We thank you for him and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Lord, bless thee and keep thee. The Lord 
Make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Have a good week.